Thank you, Lars. Um, it's an honor to be here. Pleasure. Um, with that said, I, I can honestly say that um, 20 years ago, I, I would not have thought it would be an honor to be at a technology conference um, at all. I would have thought it was super lame. Um, and I'm sort of getting this reputation from, from my Instagram feed, and, and I've heard like here and there bakers, whispers from other bakers saying, you know, that, that Chad, doesn't, Chad doesn't bake bread anymore. Um, he doesn't even post pictures of bread on his Instagram. He just flies around the world and, and uh, surfs or whatever people think I do. Um, but 20 years ago, I was, uh, I was this guy, which um, looking at that picture of myself, you, you can just see I'm, I'm an extreme, dedicated little artisan, like a caricature of an artisan. And that's kind of how I was from the beginning. Um, you know, if I could have imagined, uh, you know, like becoming Batman when I was growing up. I was, I was imagining being an artisan. And to me that meant, um, to me that meant doing everything completely without, without machines, without technology, totally by hand, and probably the most laborious way possible. So that was where we started in, um, in Point Ray Station. I had a bucket, uh, a table, and a wood-fired oven. And no mixer, everything was just mixed by hand in the bucket. And the, the whole idea of that was um, I, wanted to go, I wanted to go take this deep dive into um, learning the, the, the very bones of the process of making bread. I had apprenticed already myself, um, and I, I mean, I grew up in Texas, and I was 20 years old when I think I tasted real bread for the first time. And it was a, a baker on the, on the East Coast um, in Massachusetts that was doing this sourdough bread which is a very, it's the most elemental sort of primordial way to, that bread was made. And I tasted that. I was studying to be a chef at the time in culinary school. When I tasted this bread, um, I instantly decided that that's what I wanted to do. I'd never tasted anything like it. And it, that was like in 1990, 92, and there wasn't actually much of this kind of bread available in the US, a little bit on, on the East Coast, a little bit on the West Coast. Um, but that was how we sort of set up this bakery that was connected to our house, my wife and I. And it was, uh, again, no machines. I would start the day by just chopping wood and feeding the, the sourdough, so just mixing flour and water together and, that, and letting it ferment. Um, building a fire, the, the way that I worked, I would build the fire in the morning, it would burn for eight hours while I mixed doughs, mixed sourdoughs, mixed doughs, and then, and then somewhere there in the middle I would bake the bread uh, that was made the day before and then shape all the bread and let it rise overnight for the next day. So it was always a two-day process that kind of overlapped. Um, to, make, to get the most flavor out of bread, there, there's a lot of ways to do that with um, different ingredients. But the, the most basic way, if you're just working with wheat flour, is through fermentation. So kind of the longer you ferment up to a point, the more flavor develops. And the way that I, I would um, stretch that rising time out in this, in this pre-industrial phase that I was in, was just to open the windows at night and let it cool down, let the whole bakery cool down. And um, that would get, I would get a lot of flavor. And that was, that was like my no-tech solution for that, which worked really well for part of the year. And then when it was summertime, it didn't work. So I would go from having like eight hours to sleep to, to like five hours, and then it was totally unsustainable. Um, but that, that time was really important because um, what I learned, just working in that, that deep, deep dive in the solitary um, sort of trance state of learning this thing is that it, it, it gives you a, the knowledge, the very basic knowledge, so that then you can start, um, you can start playing with the rules, changing things, um, you know, and maybe come up with something new that, that has never been tasted before, like these guys were talking about earlier. And that's, that's kind of uh, what I want to talk about today is how I went from that, you know, no tech, completely obsessed artis artisan um, baker to now um, you know, really embracing the uh, technology and experimentation and getting inspired from, from these guys like Noma um, to really play around with what we do. Um, but back to point rays. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I forgot about that one. So artisanal um, 
the root of the word artisanal comes from, to, to instruct in the arts. And what I found when I was apprenticing myself and then when I later um, began to teach is that uh, instructing uh, to me really signifies the, um, learning and instructing signifies the most, the most elemental form of collaboration. Um, and when I, when I first apprenticed, um, I didn't think of it as a collaboration at all. You just think of it as, you know, I was young, I'm learning from someone. But it was later on when, when I started to uh, teach that I, that I thought of this as, as the first way of collaboration that had a huge effect on my life. Um, all, the, all of the sort of turning points in my career when I've, the, the boundaries of what I thought was possible um, were shifted was through collaborations. But back to point raise. Um, I was there for six years, sort of in solitary confinement, doing this, um, doing this crazy pre-industrial style of baking. Um, at some point there during the six years, I, I sort of realized that I had, I had become like this um, endangered animal. The way that the, the, the bakery was situated, it was next to our house, but then there was a park that goes by it, and there was a window, so you know, tourists would come. There's this beautiful little town just north of San Francisco called Point Ray Station, where People would come and walk through the park, and I was like the I was like the white rhino. You could look through the window, and see me in there, you know, working. And I was I was like a white rhino. I was making really great bread, but definitely kind of a one-trick white rhino. Um, at that time, towards towards the end of being in Point Reyes, um, I was working seven days a week because we needed to make more money. So I was trying to make more bread. My wife was going into the city herself to sell at the farmers markets, and I was basically didn't ever leave this little town. And I was so sleep deprived, there were days when I would just stay in my pajamas and work all day. Um, so it was, com it was completely unsustainable to, to try to um, make this amount of bread with no technology. Um, and so it's, at some point, after that six years, we, um, I think it was right after the first dot-com bubble burst, because before that, there was no way you could, you could move into San Francisco from a small town outside of San Francisco. But we, we moved into the city and, um, oops. We moved into the city and um, opened our bakery. At, that's the, the Tartine on the corner of, uh, of 18th and Guerrero. Um, we were a few years into that business and um, my wife and I made our way to New York. Um, to, to go to the James Beard Awards. We had been nominated a few times as, uh, for baking and pastry honors. And um, New York's a really fun place that time of the year. Chefs from all over the country go. Um, and we don't really get to see people that much because we're all working. But at the time we went, my wife was uh, pregnant with, with our daughter here. And um, she ended up giving birth before we got to go home on that trip. So it was... Uh, Two months premature, it was a uh, totally unexpected um, crisis moment for us. We hadn't done any sort of classes. We had no idea what to expect. We rented an apartment in New York. Um, our daughter was in the hospital for a couple of months. She was very tiny um, until she, she uh, was stable enough to leave. And at that time, we were also um, informed by the doctors that there would probably be some complications because of the childbirth being so premature. Um, and I was terrified that uh, I wouldn't be able to afford to, to support you know, a daughter with special needs. So my reaction to that very real fear was to call my literary agent, who's a good friend, from the hospital and tell her that it was time to do a bread book. It was time to put, you know, our bread was pretty well known around, around the US and the world a little bit at that time. And the idea was, you know, we're gonna put everything into a book. Mm. And so we, um, we ended up going home uh, after six, uh, six weeks, and I talked to, I had a baker that was working with me and still a really good friend. He was a young guy that was um, an apprentice at the time named Eric, and he was uh, really into photography. He wasn't a professional photographer at all, but very good. And the idea when I got home was to ask Eric if he wanted to photograph this, this bread book. And, and he was still working at the bakery, you know, every day. I, so I got him a place to live above the bakery, so I would have him on call all the time. And we basically photographed the book for two years. Um, 
and Eric wasn't my first apprentice. He was probably like the third person that I taught how to make bread. And before him, I was not, I was definitely not a good teacher. Um, I, that's Tartine Bakery, sorry. There's Eric. So before Eric, I was not a, um, I was not a good teacher at all. I, I had worked for like 10 years by myself. So I was very, and I was very sort of into being alone, working. It was like meditation. Um, and, and I wasn't used to sort of talking about what I do or how I do it. Um, this guy w asked me a lot of questions in the beginning. It was very annoying because he asked me <laughs> questions about everything. Um, but pretty early on, I, I, it became clear that this, this was the key to, um, this was the key to everything. He was asking the right questions. And, and that's where it's, it started to make sense to me that, um, that teaching someone like Eric um, was just as important as, as apprenticing. You know, for me, I was learning as much or more about what I was doing by answering his questions. And the, the questions that I, the, the answers to the questions became the book, actually. And, and it's, it's just translated into Japanese. It's been translated into Danish because I spent a lot of time in Denmark, too. Um, but Eric and I also had, we had, a, we had kind of a, 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 an apprenticeship and a mentorship going both ways. I was teaching him bread, and he was teaching me how to surf. Um, he was trying to, trying to make me healthier, I think, because um, I was going out a lot, seeing music almost every night. And, um, and I was, so I was teaching him bread. He grew up in San Diego. He's a great surfer. So I still surf to this day, and it's, it's one of the great sort of gifts of my life, someone teaching me how to surf. Um, so during this book project with Eric, the other thing that kind of came up um, that ended up being a driving sort of um, a, a, a decision made to, uh, to drive creativity internally is to do that thing, to give away all the knowledge that you have. Um, I mean, if you, if you do that, I, I saw, you know, El Bulli, we, you know, anyone in the food world that, that, that's curious is, was following all that stuff that El Bulli was doing. And the thing that, you know, all the, all the things they were doing um, in the kitchen with food was really interesting, but, but psychologically the, the thing that struck with, uh, stuck with me and influenced me more was how they, you know, every year they would put all those things that no one had ever done before into a book and, and get it out there. And, and, it, and, you know, you can't, if you're like them or us, you know, you can't, you can't just keep doing the same old thing. You just put it out there, and, and you're going to see it sort of spread around the world, all these techniques. And so I, you know, I wanted to do that in bread, basically. Um, I started to look around, uh, and you know, there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of innovation happening in bread, kind of understandably. I mean, bread is, is a staple food that people eat you know, every day. Um, but I did see, I did see like I mentioned, El Bulli, uh, what chefs were doing. El Bulli was sort of towards the end of their, of their um, run where they, they're, they're converting the whole place into an educational institute that's focused on a lot of these things we're talking about. Um, Noma was definitely, that, at that time, number one, one of those years and, and uh, multiple years. And then, and then a good friend of mine, Relay, who's also sort of descended from all those same people, he was just open this, this first year. And I went to Copenhagen to to sort of see what this all was about, and and I, I like I said, I wasn't really finding a lot of um, a lot of uh, sort of new new directions in bread, so I went I went to to chef friends that were doing it in in food, not bread, um, and you know the, we, we had a lot of conversations about this. I mean, there's there's thousands of ingredients uh, used to to make you know a meal with bread. At the time, at least, it was, you know, it's like, it's just flour, water, and salt. And even just when you say flour, m to most people, that means wheat. And when you say wheat, to most people, that means white flour or whole grain. In Scandinavia and, and, and parts of Europe, they use rye, but not much else. Because the, the whole sort of um, commodification of, of um, grain has just led to this, uh, has led to this, um, you know, being kind of one thing. So... I went to Denmark because they were, um, they were people that were researching bringing back these, these heirloom Nordic varieties of wheat that hadn't been cultivated for a couple of generations. And I had no idea that was happening until I got there. It was, um, it was super interesting. So then um, 
the idea for another book came about because I was basically, um, I, I basically told the whole story in the first bread book, the one I did with Eric, up from you know apprenticing to to the present time. So that there was no there was no more story to tell. So I had to kind of make it. So I went to find these guys and um, and what I saw was was. Um, was chefs like seem to be having a lot more fun than I was like you know you, you saw this last presentation where they're they're foraging for ants and fermenting grasshoppers and all this stuff it's it's amazing so um, I, I, I there was a curiosity and then there was um, there was a curiosity and there was a sort of a boredom that I was having like not the not not boredom in a negative way but boredom in a way like I saw these people around me not not settling, not resting in to, to what they were doing. They're just constantly sort of challenging and, and, and sharing their ideas and pushing, pushing these things forward. Um, so at that point, it was, it was like, there was a new kind of collaboration. It wasn't, it wasn't learning or teaching. It became a collaboration of, of finding colleagues around me, um, a lot of these guys here, that, that were doing things that I had never thought of. And, and you know, it was super inspiring, and, and at the same time, I, I was thinking, I need to learn from these people because I don't know what they're doing. It's, it's incredible. I also want to be one of those people at some point. I would love to be someone who is able to inspire the way they were inspiring me in, in my own field, which would be, which would be bread. Um, I traveled to Copenhagen, and I, I met, just again, all the chefs, but then I did finally, I, meet, I met some people that were more like farmers, um, this one in this picture, this guy, uh, this is a farm just north of Copenhagen where they're making, growing all the grain, milling the grain, making beer out of the grain. Um, really incredible stuff. Uh, there is a piece of this bread in your bags that um, my head baker who grew up here in London, he's, he, he baked this this morning, he came back to bake this bread. But this bread is a, is a collaboration that you can eat. Um, This is, a, this is a collaboration you can eat. Um, there's a story, uh, the, I went there to, to do all these other things, um, but I, I, was, I was interested in learning about this kind of Danish rye bread. This is the basic bread of, of you know, the Danes grow up on. And it's, it's there, was, there was one chef uh, baker that I met that made a version, there's, there's hundreds of versions of this kind of bread. There's one that, that I really liked the best, and uh, it's a chef named Rene Bolvig. It's a different Rene, uh, but, from maybe the generation before of chefs. But when I told him that I really loved his bread, he just gave me the recipe immediately. And, and I went home and, and we made a, a version that was you know, not more, more sort of Northern California than Northern Europe. Um, we sprouted all the grains, kind of made it in a little bit of a hippie uh, Danish bread. And it, it, when you sprout the grains, it, it, it turns it from a grain to more of a plant. So it's, it's, it's different the way that it, you digest it. And, so in my mind, at least, it made it a little bit lighter. Um, we've been making it for like five years in, in uh, San Francisco, and there wasn't much of this kind of bread in, in that part of the world, but now it's, it's becoming popular. People like it. Um, but that idea that is one of the most powerful that I took from, from Copenhagen, which was um, this idea of uh, creative competition. And by that, I mean, um, you know, it, it's, I think part of it's because Copenhagen is a really small, tight-knit community, but people wouldn't, hide, people wouldn't hide the secrets and all the innovation that they were doing, but you also were really expected to not copy it at all, or take it, but turn it upside down, or take it in a totally new direction. And I had never seen that anywhere, in a, in a, in, especially in the food world. Everyone has a lot of secrets, and, you know, we still have a few, but really what I saw was th these guys... Um, just completely open, open sourcing and, and sharing their things, but again with the with the, um, uh, you know, the notion that you're not going to copy it, like it just wouldn't happen. Um, so this is a ver this is another version where we sort of re reconceptualized that bread with buckwheat instead of rye or wheat. With buckwheat's a grass, not even a wheat. Um, so. We're sort of starting this whole new thing um, in San Francisco. It's, we're building our first new space after 15 years, and it's, it's a huge space, 5,000 square feet, big for us. And the whole, uh, the whole place is, is basically dedicated to um, upholding the principles of, of this collaboration. Um, part of it is, is uh, we'll be milling our own grain, um, using stuff from 
researchers at Washington State University that are breeding lots of actually these Nordic grains that I brought back and that they sourced after I, I told them this is really amazing stuff that was happening. And so they've got dozens of varieties that they're breeding um, for flavor and nutrition, which is not the way wheat's been selected uh, for the past few generations, typically. Um, another collaboration that's happening in our buildings is also from Washington State. Is, uh, we're located inside of a building that uh, houses a, a ceramic factory, a pretty renowned one in, in San Francisco. They, they just won a design award, I think, uh, yesterday, a national design award. And um, basically, our 5,000 square feet is in this much larger building, and, and it's all separated by glass walls. So on the other side of that, that they have a little shop inside, but on the other side, there's three giant Turkish kilns, and people are making all the architectural tiles, plates, bowls, and all of that, that you'll be, there'll be another glass wall, and you'll see into where we're milling, we're baking, we're cooking, and you'll be, we'll be eating off of the plates that are made there. So um, we, we've got it, built a kitchen so we can invite um, chef friends from around the world to collaborate with us, and we want it to be all open and, and for people to see so that we can create this space that um, will be an inspiration. Hopefully. Um, so the funny thing to me is, uh, you know, that with the no machine ethos in the beginning is that, is that now technology is, is at the heart of everything we're going to do. Um, but we're not, um, we're, not, we're not replacing one with the other. Like in, a, in our Heath space, we've got, we've got a wood-fired oven, the most traditional oven that we started with next to the most high-tech oven that's available in the world, which is our thermal oil ovens built in Germany. But we, I want to continue to teach the traditional method while really showing how we can use technology. Um, I believe it's necessary to have both uh, tradition and cutting edge technology because the tradition should inform the innovation, not constrain it, and the innovation should complement the tradition, not replace it. Um, another thing, the technology should be able to enable us to um, something uh, uh, Mark was mentioning before, and, and Lars and Ariel, is to make some of this, some of this food that's super artisanal, and, and, and because of that, it's going to be more expensive, and, you know, I was a guy that's been, I mean, still, 200 loaves a day, it's just, it's not really getting out there for much, for many people, um, but so, sort of uh, using technology to, to aid what we do so that we can maybe um, uh, shift some of that cost of producing it to sourcing better ingredients and things so that we can make what I like to call like an artisanal industrial product that would be made with the same ingredients, the same flavor, the same nutrition, but cheaper and available to more people. Um, my first mentor, Richard Bourdon here, um, used to say that our job security is this, like what we make could never be made by machines. And it was absolutely true at that time. There was no machine that could that could handle the doughs, the super wet doughs, and kind of over-fermented. Um, but I feel like now um, machines can do what we do in a way um, if we design them to aid the artisan process. And, and this is kind of what I feel like is my new job security, is um, to find out how to use machines to make uh, technology, um, technology to make our hands much more powerful than they could have ever been for ourselves and for the people we love and for the people that we hope to collaborate with. <laughs>